chakras. Oh, the amethyst has fallen off my meridian. Hiya, I'm Dom. And I'm Misha. And I have a chronic illness. Me too. So welcome to Anything Short of a Coffee Enema. A podcast on which we'll discuss the things we do or have done to function. And set each other challenges or tasks every time. We are prepared to go to any lengths to achieve reasonable health. Short of a macchiato, up your jacksy. So here we have another bonus episode. Yay, appendices. Um, which is not... <laughs> Which is not about baths. Um, not about baths. Sorry, it's that's just how this. We can started. probably cut the bath bit out. This one is going to be on the subject of shame. Yes, because as we were talking about doctors, we also talked about not being embarrassed to say things, mm. and that brings up the idea of being ashamed of whatever it is your body's doing or your brain is doing mm. within the wider context of the world and our culture. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, um, my no, you, tummy keeps rumbling a lot. You don't have to apologise. It's the sensitive microphones. I doubt they're that sensitive. We'll find so out. So we're probably fine. I, I feel like there's someone like... <laughs> yeah. This was, a, this was a huge one for me. I have to say I've been a little bit nervous contemplating this as a, as a subject. So for me, with my personal thing, it's just... Uh, it's ferociously embarrassing to admit that you're an alcoholic. Yeah. Like it's I, really, having really, not been an alcoholic, can understand that that would be the case. Yeah, it's really embarrassing. So you never told me officially. We started a podcast, and you gave me a story, no, no, and I kind was, of, I kind of vaguely knew, yeah. but I didn't really know. Yeah, you yeah. never told me. I've this been is, at your house. I've met your wife and your child, yeah. and more importantly to yeah. me, I've met your pets. Yeah, yeah, and you still never told me. This has all been this entire podcast was just set up as a way for me to tell you, Dom, that I'm, I'm also probably to avoid <laughs> having to tell other people. So they look, listen to the podcast. I, I talk about it there. Yeah. I have to talk about it with you. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah, so like here's here are some of the the issues that it throws up. Um, your ability to actually get help is really seriously curtailed. Yeah. Because the way, of course, that we tend to deal with things that are shameful is that we hide them. And I should stop using plurals. Let's let's try and make this as uncomfortable as possible for me. What I did was I hid it and yes. I lied about it, even in yes. the face of people who fucking knew. knew. Of course they knew. Yeah. Which is insulting for them because unavoidably they feel like you're treating them like they're total fucking morons. Um, and it's bad because there are a certain number of people in your life guaranteed who will, to a greater or lesser extent, play along because it's just too fucking hard to also do be- else. Also because, and this is entirely 100% accurate, there is no point trying to help someone who does not want to be helped and who does not want to help themselves. You can try and you will generally fail in yeah, my experience because I've tried many times mm. with friends yeah, yeah. and family members yeah. and if they're not ready to yeah. even consider being helped or consider admitting that they may need help with anything, then you can't help them. Yeah. And it's a great way to get blocked from someone's life that you care about sometimes. It's true. That definitely can happen. That being said, the flip side of that is without um, family and soon-to-be wife bullying me, I wouldn't have had any interactions yes. with treatment and I would almost certainly... Well, I mean, there's a... I'm not saying you can't make a dig. I'm just saying you yeah. can't... Sometimes you've got to let them... Yeah, there's not going to be... Trot like, along a yeah. little bit in their fantasy world whilst reminding yeah. them occasionally that perhaps it's a fantasy world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's, there's not going to be a guarantee. So, some things that I did, I would... Um, go to psychologists and massively understate the amount that I drank. Yeah. I would gleefully accept, um, or at least on one occasion, I gleefully accepted like going on antidepressants just as a kind of, oh, it's got to be depression. It's not the depressant that I'm taking in, in yeah. gigantic quantities on a daily yeah. basis. That can't possibly be the problem. <laughs> so, so to the scrambling of brain chemistry that alcohol was doing, I added Prozac for a little while, and that yeah, wasn't a great idea um, yeah. in any way, shape, or form. Another tie into our previous episode on doctors, you know, this is another area where some can get you like the idea that someone would throw antidepressants at somebody who who's not actually isn't. clinically been diagnosed yeah with depression yeah but th- this is also someone who is you know and when i say understating like my understating of the amount that i drank is still you're fucking in dangerous territory pal yeah. like settle down again nothing against this particular doctor i'm sure what they were thinking was well this person's saying they're self-medicating therefore if i give them medication they'll stop they, with they'll the self stop. part yes so, um, there's that. Now, and then there's all, 
I'm not even going to get into the other embarrassing things that are just part of life when you're an alcoholic. Suffice it to say that, best case scenario, there's a lot of vomiting in the morning, um, which is not... A lot of good vomit in the morning. Yeah, yeah, which is not super duper pleasant, but it's Look, just like... You have vomiting in the morning, I have poop explosions, we all have our thing. Yeah, but it's just like basically what I'm saying is it's fucking sordid. It's a yeah. sordid existence yeah. and therefore you, you tend not to talk about it. This is one of those areas where I'm finding more and more as I look into addiction and as I look into mental health, there's a terrible kind of paradox at the heart of this, which is the best thing for you when you're feeling ashamed about something is to do precisely the thing that you don't want to do, yeah. which is to say, go find someone to talk to Discuss about it. it. Yeah. Yeah. So the good thing in the addiction area is that it's actually really easy to find large groups of those people. You might not want to go along and do it, but um, no matter what problems, and I have manifest problems with 12-step groups, the one thing that I will go to the barricades for them about is just the idea of getting a load of people who are going through the same thing into the same room at the same time is genius. Total, yeah. amazing, incredible stroke of genius, and it helps so, so much. You don't have to interact in any way with the 12 steps, but just I'm not alone other people who are doing this, even more importantly, there are people who are worse than me. Yep. There are people who are better. Gives you some perspective. It's amazing. Um, but but God, once you're there, you do actually have to stand up and talk about yourself, and that not necessarily. I'm not just saying yeah. Alcoholics yeah. Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous yeah. or whatever those things are. At some point, you do have to stand up and say, "I have a thing, and yeah. it's not great." Yeah. Yeah. And start talking about it. I think with medical professionals or people that who have been in that spot, so people that have the same condition as you or people that have been where you've been, whether yeah. or not they're better or not or whatever, are going to be more easy to chat to about it because at least they have some framework to understand it. Yeah. Um, when it comes to talking to your loved ones, your family, your friends, your workmates, I think that's where it gets a lot harder. Mm. Yeah. Also, just by the way, to a very large extent, kind of don't go harboring dreams about they're going to understand. They can't. They actually can't. Yeah. They have no framework to put that in to mm. understand. That's why it's easy to tell, to not easy. It's easier to talk to people who have been through it or mm. are going through it because at least they have some framework to understand what you're talking about. Yeah. So I remember you and I had a discussion. I think it started off air maybe worked this way on air in like the pilot or something we talked about functionality and when I said functionality what I meant was able to take myself to the toilet on my own and shower and actually ingest food Mm. you meant in your head functionality meant going through the day-to-day motions of a life while you know looking like a normal human being Mm. oh my god that's like heaven I wish I could do that every day but Yeah. yeah so depending on your experience how you interpret information is always going to be different yeah. and understand words and whatnot. And if somebody, even if they love you and they've watched you go through it, they haven't been through it, they don't understand fully what all those words mean, mm. even if it's just like pain. Mm. They just don't fully always understand. I'm now kind of on the opinion sometimes it's not worth explaining. Sometimes it's just worth going really shorthand this is what I'm capable of today yeah. and being really black and white about it even though it's never black and white it's always yeah, grey yeah. and that being black and white is really hard because it feels like you're putting yourself in a box mm. and that is very shameful yeah. to do because it's not something we encourage within society is it yeah, yeah. no not at all yeah that's really interesting um, so I so for me, the embarrassment was around. It's just, it's a statistical fact that somewhere between eighty eight and ninety two percent of people who use mind or mood altering substances can do so in a way that they have a high degree of control over. Yeah. Which is to say, can start and stop at will. Yep. Um, use in ways that do not noticeably interfere with their life. Or they're not using instead of 
something else yeah. instead of focusing on something, instead of dealing with something. Yeah, worthwhile distinction yeah. to make, yeah. Or, you know, and to the extent that people have, there's something that happened to me while I was under the influence that's a bit over the line, mm. it tends to be of the amusing, can dine out on the story yeah. variety. Yep. So for me, it's like an acute consciousness of there's something about me which is... Or they ask you... Why did that happen to you? Like, A, you had control over it. Mm. You never really have control over something like that. You know, was there something to do with your family? They're trying to look for something that they can understand rather mm. than just being able to go, in isolation, this person has something. Mm. Kind of let them come to telling you why, if it's a mm. deeply personal reason, or yeah. if, there's no per- if there's no reason, just let them tell you that. But they often ask those sort of questions because they need to understand but that's also incredibly personal. Yeah, a lot yeah, of the, yeah. If there is a reason, yeah. it's something that you don't want to talk about unless you know, you're know you paying someone to talk to them about it yeah, yeah, or you know it's your significant other or whatever. Yeah. yeah. There's also like we're very we're narratively driven creatures. 100% so we true. want the story and we want to, oh, this comes back to that's the origin of it, blah, 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 now I get it. Yeah, it's so they can it's understand. It's really... <laughs> that simple no um, nothing nothing in health wellness psychology ev- anything like that is yeah. ever simple because we are complex creatures yeah, yeah yeah i don't think it's simple even with animals i work with animals every day and yeah. i don't think it's simple with animals and no, i would no. we're a lot more complex than most animals yeah yeah absolutely yeah so i think if i understand correctly like you you have similar kind of networks to me in terms of discussing things with people who've been through the same or similar kind of areas. Yours exists very much more kind of online, is that? Yeah, well, I mean, you can't... um, If none of you have any energy or if you've all got orthostatic intolerance and standing up is hard, getting to a place to all chat is pretty hard. So, yes, there's a lot of online places... And I used to have more... I've edited it down to the places that mostly Melbourne-based, actually. Most of the people in all my online groups that are all kind of going through the same thing happen to all be Melbourne-based. And I don't think that's because we exchange doctor information or anything. I think it's mostly because those are the people that use a lot of the same vocab Mm. as me. And so therefore we can understand it. And it's also so that you can go, holy shit, it's still 30 degrees and it's 1am in the morning. I need to vent because I'm feeling really emotional about how this is impacting my physical health. And I know these people are going through exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So location, I think, does help in that aspect. Um, It's one of those funny things, though, like because they've gone through it and because you don't see them, because you don't have to get, you don't have to look at the physical reaction you're much more candid Mm. online in those sort of spheres. Like I can say stuff to them that I don't really, I've got a couple of people in my life who have been through chronic illnesses and they're probably further along than I am or whatever. I still sometimes, if I'm talking face to face with them, I can't say some of the stuff that I can say to the people that are going through the same things as me online because I'm, I'm unconsciously worried about the actual physical reaction or even worse, that kind of, (gasps) I don't know what to say, pause, like you've just overloaded the information and then you feel so bad about it, but you still, that's an important part of being a human. You're trying to share and connect and all that sort of stuff and you're just like, oh crap, I stumped them. That makes me feel bad. They're feeling bad probably too, but I feel bad now that I burdened them or whatever. There's a lot of talk around that internally. Um, And I think that's, again, where a lot of those ideas of shame come in. You don't say those things because you're scared of that. Yeah in your face immediate reaction because you can't change that yeah and people can't edit it you know they can't write something like what a fucking moron you are and they go delete 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 oh dude that sucks you know feel free to vent yeah. rather than <laughs> going idiot yeah. yeah suddenly i have a very clear picture of how you interact with people online and also <laughs> probably in text messages to me uh, text messages for everyone, especially the people who, because I worked in the, work in the animal industry and I worked in the animal industry forever, people calling me at, you know, whatever time on whatever day going, oh, my cat vomited up a hairball. Do I need to take it to the vet? Oh, God. Is it just, what's, okay, let's dissect exactly what is in the hairball. <laughs> it's probably okay. If you're worried, take it to the vet. 
Uh, amazing. Yeah. And I've done that to someone, but I, I called someone specifically wanting a specific answer because I'm in the same industry. But yeah, yeah I do sometimes think people are morons. Yeah. It's surgery where they're, yeah. you know, if it's not my usual GP or whatever, and they're saying something, I'm just like, yeah, I've, I've done this before. It's okay. I know how to have blood taken. Yeah. Oh, my friend, I'm across that sort mm. of thing. Yeah. Mm. There's a kind of um, a couple of things that I think we've touched on that might might be worth highlighting, as it were. Um, coming back to the, if you like, if you possibly can, if you can have some kind of professional care provider in your life who's been there or been there adjacent. Yep. Oh my God, grab hold. Do not let go. And sometimes. don't let go. Yeah. Um, in the like, oh man, so useful in the addiction area, just because so much of the bullshit just goes out the window. Um, my last, the last time I did a mental health care plan, um, it was four sessions before I had trained, like literally trained this psychologist into not asking me about stuff that wasn't important. Yeah. Um, and it was things like, like in that case, it was, I couldn't get a non fixated over my former AA sponsor who died of liver cancer and who I was you know, with in the hospital for mm. quite a long time while he was mortally ill and then also when he So because she's away. trying to process that information or what that would feel like for her, she kept trying to talk to yeah, you about what it feels like to you. Yeah, it's like you're she's... like, um, I need some help in other areas right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just like, no, 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 I, I need my temperature taken in all these other areas. I'm actually, I'm okay with how yeah. I've dealt with that. It's, it's no biggie. But like it was, it's really hard. Mm. I know on the other hand that had I... Um, had I still had the option of going to certain AOD counsellors with whom I now had a professional relationship, so it was impossible, yeah. um, that there just would have been no bullshit about that. I sat down and said, yeah, Dan passed away. That was really hard. Yeah, yeah, knew Dan too. Okay, yeah. so what else are we going to do about that? What else it? are we talking about today? Yeah. yeah. We've still there's got 55 a, minutes. That's right. Yeah. yeah, there's a kind of cut through the bullshit thing, which is really, really important. I find it interesting that you said, um, I just want to throw a theory at you, um, Grant you, it's much, much easier online to sometimes say certain things. Maybe this is just context-specific, but my God, if you go to enough Narcotics Anonymous meetings, quite specifically that group, you develop an unbelievably high tolerance for just saying, X happened to me. Yeah, or, okay. My, my hunch is, like a lot of other things, that becomes so much easier with time repetition repetition, yeah and and again like especially in that context that is the stories are just as bad ultimately in alcoholics anonymous i don't mean to minimize don't mean to suggest that na is some kind of weird zoo but people get down to narcotics anonymous i imagine having never been to a meeting Uh, therefore it makes me an expert obviously (laughs) um it's a broader range of what people are taking with uppers, downers, depressants, non-depressants, all sorts of things. So it's not, I imagine the stories are a lot more varied is what I'm trying to say. D- there's that. What I'm thinking of is, is two things. People get into financial trouble much, much more quickly. Their chances of having what one might euphemistically call interactions with the legal sphere are far more likely as well. Those two things what in combination you, make for way, way, way more trouble. Yeah and way more kind of crazy scenarios and situations. Yeah. Um, it's definitely, it's my experience that even in workplaces now, I've never in my life worked in such open, let's talk about your feelings areas, as in yeah. drug and alcohol rehabilitation. Um, in one workplace that I now look back on and consider as being moderately toxic and one that I think of as being much better now, just in both places, the kind of you're having a shitty day, let's have a chat about it and see what we can do about it. it happened in a way that has never happened for me. Yeah, I've never had that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I just want to make sure that also when we're talking about shame, I think one of the most important things to talk about is your fear of what society already thinks of you before mm. as, as you're trying to talk about something or as you're mm. trying to admit something, which is probably why you never had that conversation with me about the fact you're an alcoholic Mm. as a proper sit down conversation Mm. because there are certain assumptions you make like that you assume people are making about you. There's lots of assumptions. There's assumptions in all directions. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, Often people aren't making assumptions. 
Like I know we think they are, but often they're not because everyone's got their own shit going on and sometimes you can be admitting the worst thing in the world to them and they're they're half listening. They're not always 100% listening. Mm. Most people aren't 100% listening most of the time. (laughs) They're like, I'm really interested in what you're trying to say. I do have to pick up my child in 45 minutes. Uh, So I've got to make sure that I'm out the door and I do need to go to the toilet. (laughs) Shit, dude, really? Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah. yeah. Like people's heads are never in one spot all the time, I think, Mm. especially if you're trying to have a sit down. Life-changing conversation. Yeah. Because for you it's life-changing. For them... It's probably, you know, it's changing maybe the way they have to interact with you or they feel mm. like they have to interact with you. Yeah. But it's not life-changing to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Having said that, I still haven't told some people in my life that have chronic illness because mm. if they're not, if I haven't told them, then they're not close enough in my life for them to need to know, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, there are a lot of people like... A lot of members of my family even who I haven't had the explicit conversation with. Yeah. And okay. I'm sure if they thought about it for 10 seconds, they probably know. It would be totally, completely, and absolutely obvious. Yeah. Like, wow, I've always seen him with a drink in his hand. Now he knows. At every he has a drink. former, you know, family occasion. Christmas, any do fucking or whatever, variety. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Now, all of a sudden, not. Hmm. Again, if you thought about that, it takes three and a half seconds to connect the dots. And but come people up with... don't think about other people that much. Exactly. Honestly, don't notice. There's another another thing, by the way, something I encounter all the time. One of the weirdest, most demented fears you have as someone in recovery from addiction is that you're going to have a conversation that'll go something like this. Want a drink? No. Why not? Mm-hmm. And get the third degree. I get that and I'm not a recovering alcoholic because I refuse alcohol. And then people get so weird, like you're judging them for drinking alcohol. Mate, you do what you want with your body and your time. You've totally fucked over I actually don't give a damn. (laughs) You've completely fucked over my Sorry. Anyway, it's, um, my suggestion was going to be, it's actually generally not as bad as that. Dom just has really savage and unpleasant friends. I have a family (laughs) which is okay with alcoholism. I'm going to put that out there. So it's not my friends that say that. It's generally my family. Yeah, right. It's, uh, an aunt who is very close to me and my family yeah. and she still gets me a bottle of wine at my birthday. Yeah. I haven't drunk in years and yeah. I keep telling her that. Yeah. But it's fine. I'll so start that's... drinking soon. <laughs> no, no. I'm okay with it. Stop it. Anyway, that's personal. That yeah. is not everybody's that's experience. A, that's an N of one experience. That's oh. totally anecdotal evidence. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. It's It's theoretically possible that that happens. The vast majority of the time, the worst that you're in for is a little bit of very mild ribbing. Yes. And very, that's very how mild. Australians deal with a lot of that shit. Yeah. And it's how I deal with a lot of it too. I, you know, in what I said before about poop explosions, like it's slightly more horrifying when it happens, but mm. I'm not going to go into the actual details of no. it. Poop explosions is a much funnier way. And I can make a nice anecdote out of that whilst yeah. telling you something that's kind of important to me because it was slightly scarring at the time or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I can yeah. have a chat about it and have a good old laugh. Yeah. Humor is important in many ways. Don't let it be the only way you chat about things because yeah. it can be sometimes. So true. So true. And, and again, like for me, like, as I said, like as far as I've gone, there's just, it's just, Oh my God, there are so many sordidnesses to do with um addictive behavior of any kind and again like i'm for a variety of reasons there's a kind of misery porn that sometimes goes into this i think which i'm eager to avoid and again like i'm saving myself some shame and embarrassment at this particular point here but there's you know again to the extent that you can as dom has kind of suggested you know hint at joke your way around yep These are important things. Um, It's not just, you know, laughter is the best medicine as a point, but humour really can take the sting out of... It can. It can take... I find I use humour as a way to make sure the other person's okay with what I'm saying. Mm, Because if I'm saying it, I am obviously okay with it. Yeah. Um, So there are people in my life where I don't use humour in that way because I kind of don't care that much if they're okay with it. Yeah. I need something from them and they're part of my support network. We've yeah. got a, a relationship where that's okay. It's already yeah. been discussed at some point. Um, but for a lot of people, it's humour most of the time. Yeah. Whilst, you know, a moment within the humour of being serious. But mm. 
because that's the most comfortable way for them. And I want them to feel comfortable because the more comfortable everybody feels like talking about that stuff, the less likely in a couple of years' time you can have to use humour to chat about it yeah, as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it comes to workplaces, obviously in your workplace, it's okay to talk about addiction. Yeah. Duh. In my workplace, I've, I've really struggled actually. Where I was working when I got diagnosed, it was really problematic because they didn't have any understanding of what those words meant yeah. and they couldn't understand what it meant and what that meant for me at work and how to manage me at work mm. I ended up leaving that place because I put in structure and they routinely ignored it and I was like well I need to do something for yeah, me so yeah, I need yeah. to leave that workplace where I am now what I did was in my um, cover letter it was in my cover letter that I have yeah. this and this is I didn't necessarily speak about what it meant in the cover letter. There was a paragraph in it on my in my CV, and when I went into the interview, I we started off talking about other stuff, but I brought it back to mm. me and my body and what my body needs pretty quickly because I didn't have time to use humour in that situation. I had yeah. to be quick and serious and go. If you guys aren't okay with dealing with this structure yeah. then this isn't the workplace for me I'm not the person you need to hire yeah, yeah, for yeah. this particular place and, and you don't want to waste your time going to 50,000 interviews talking around this kind of energy. stuff yes yeah, exactly. but also it's it is uncomfortable I've never been I interview very well and I've never been nervous for a job interview ever mm. I was so nervous for that job interview not because I didn't think I could do the job I knew I could do it standing on my head and comatose yeah. the problem was that I didn't know how they would react they didn't give a damn. They went, okay, that's fine. We'll find out the schedule that works for you. Once we've got that, you let us know what you can do and you can't do. Mm. It was just about making sure that the right things were put in place. Basically, it meant making sure my availability was the right thing for yeah. me, all that sort of stuff. And making sure that if somebody else is working with me, like the other people working with me were of a physically strong enough way to make sure that I wasn't going to do all the heavy lifting yeah. and stuff like that myself. Yeah. Um, and making sure that it was quite clear that if I was going to be unwell and not being able to rock up to either let them know the night before if I could or to let them know straight away or to rock up and I could just stand there until they can get somebody else. I didn't have to do anything. Yeah. I didn't even have to, you know, I could just be out the back hiding. Yeah. Somebody had to be there basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they would make sure that I didn't have to actually physically do anything. And when I couldn't work for a couple of weeks, they were fine about it. So... Even those conversations which you're super nervous about and you think that they're going to make a big deal of it, often in a workplace environment, in my experience, as long as you're really clear and yeah. you choose your words carefully, practice beforehand, obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you tend to be okay. It is important, I think, though, to continue to have those conversations because staff never stays the same. You, there's always no, staff turnover. Yeah. You need to keep yeah. checking in and making sure that they're aware that they need to check in with you or whatever it is. So, you know, a lot of the time these people wouldn't have been through this before no, either. Exactly. So they don't know what to do. Yeah. And sometimes you just need to go, this is all I need from you. And yeah. they go, excellent, you've told me what to do. We will do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is like, this is the reason in job interviews that there's the kind of question that can sometimes seem really stupid, which is like, what can we do to support you? Yeah. And they actually do want to hear something. Because... Like a bad answer for them is, no, I'm good. Because Be God knows what that could mean. Because if you got kids and it means that you kind of would rather work home from home once a week, mm. say it then. Because yeah. if they can accommodate it and you're a good enough candidate, they'll find a way to do so. It just means they need to understand how they want to structure things. Yeah, um, yeah it's not because they want to ask wanky questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. And it's funny, like, as you said, like, there's no, there's no problem talking about addiction in the areas where I work. Like... The place that I work at the moment happens to have a huge amount of staff who don't have what's euphemistically described as a lived experience. Right, okay. Um, and it is actually, it's really interesting because... So you're their little, like, not dictionary, but you're their little encyclopedia sometimes? No, but they're, many people are unaware. Oh, um, okay. Totally unaware. They they're either unaware or they're fucking assholes. Because, <laughs> um, <laughs> they keep asking you to go out for Friday night drinks. No, no, no. Well, they don't ask to go out to Friday night drinks, but there's, just, like, there's a certain amount of... Like, again, a lot of them, like 88 to 92% of the population, yeah, can quite fine. happily have those substances, and they're fine. So there, there will be, like, kind of... I feel really weird talking about, you know, certain things, but, yeah, we're going to be... 
you know, um, champagneing it up on Friday night or whatever. Not that yeah. things are that bad, but it's just, you know, there's that. And it's also like I found it, I was going for jobs that said lived experience, highly regarded. Yes. And I still found it hard. To say it. To put on cover letter. I. This is. Do you, would you say I am an alcoholic? I am a recovered alcoholic. I have been an alcoholic. These are really. And, and Did I occasionally have a fondness for alcohol? Yes, it's maybe. It's really tricky. I'm it's, excellent for this job. Yeah, it's really tricky because also like whether you say I'm a recovering alcoholic, yeah. I'm a recovered alcoholic yeah. actually says a lot politically about how you feel about the nature yeah, of Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it does. So there's Let's another like. Let's delve into that. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. Another slight kind of minefieldy area. My favorite of all time. I think also how they perceive that. Because not just how you mm. perceive it, you're perceiving it a certain way, they're perceiving it a certain way too. Because yeah, they yeah, yeah. words are important. Practice if you're gonna say something you're worried about what they're gonna say back, yeah, yeah. practice so that yeah. it is exactly what you mean to say. Dead right. My favourite of all time in this area was um someone who was applying to do work placement at, at somewhere where I was working at one point and um I said to them on the phone because I knew this was the case, look, you're only gonna get the attention of the manager here if you've not just been through this but been through the Alcoholics Anonymous kind of system okay. of dealing with this. Yeah. That's like the only way I said. I strongly advise you, even if you're not prepared to put it on a resume, put it in an email when you send it. It will get their attention. You've got a far better likelihood. Oh, thanks, 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 thanks. Yeah. I saw this person's CV when they sent it in Lived experience was nowhere mentioned, but they did have responsible service of alcohol certificate on their seat. <laughs> I just did a really big face palm in case anybody didn't hear that. I, and what I love about that is... It's very sweet. It's, it's so totally, completely and utterly sweet. It's like that is way more acceptable and way more natural to everyone yep. to put on their job description than the really crucial, important, yep. you know, deal-making... Yeah scenario but it tells you that from you having already spoken to him it tells you that he's probably not ready for that job if he can't oh no he, he got he got the he got placement it? and that's oh, going to okay. be that's going to be his life he was more highly qualified still just, than i am just didn't want to just didn't connect somehow okay. um maybe you know i don't know if everybody rewrites their cv every like i tailor my cv to every single job yeah you really should if I, you don't do you that should, people but i think I a lot this of people is an don't episode on shame but yeah, that's. <laughs> you see, when it comes also to family members, what I kind of did is I kind of also went, okay, I'm going to tell my dad all, all the things. Yeah. I'm just going to leave it to him to tell everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is nothing wrong with no. that. I don't feel like I have to have those hard conversations, yeah. but the people around me know that there's something and they can check in with me. They yep. don't have to check in with me. Yep. There's no pressure on them to behave a certain way, uh -huh. but at least everybody's informed. Yeah, yeah, such a good call. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you have someone in your life who, and my dad's not particularly, he's not like a gossiper or anything. Yeah, yeah. He just has the most contact with everybody. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, he's the one to tell because he happens yeah. to talk to everyone. And I think he kind of knew I was using him for that. I was a. I didn't quite say it, but I said it euphemistically, and he was happy to do that for yeah, me yeah, yeah. because it's you have to. Super I always happy. felt also that with family or loved ones, they can't necessarily actually physically help you a lot no, of the time exactly. because a lot of the time it's just you, they you can't. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, you yeah. have to go through it or you have yeah. to learn that lesson or whatever it is. So giving them something where they feel like they're helping you fucking great helps everybody yeah, makes yeah. them feel like they're helping you makes them feel like they're involved get something out of the way a little bit for you makes you feel like you don't have to feel guilty about not asking for help sometimes mm. all that sort of stuff because guilt and shame are best mates and they live together all the time yeah. yeah if you can outsource some things sometimes and make a big deal of it in a, not yeah. a big deal but go hey can you please do this for me yeah hey thank you so much that was amazing appreciate yeah, yeah, yeah. it and all it is is just acknowledging what they did yeah. can make everyone feel good yeah. including you a little bit but certainly everyone around you and your support network and I yeah. think in my head that makes me feel like then I'm, I'm giving them some agency over yeah, what yeah, is yeah. actually affecting them as absolutely. well absolutely absolutely and they are like 
you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for your particular situation, but certainly in the area of addiction, the helplessness that other people feel yeah. around you is profound. And any, like, awful way to put it, but any bone you can throw them in terms of, hey, if you do this thing, yeah. it'll really help out, is going to make the most enormous difference to them. It's not yeah. even morally amusing. I'm, I'm going to give an example of it, which... Mm. Maybe it's a bit too much, or maybe it's not enough. I don't know, whatever. But I'm going to give an example where it's not just like, hey, can you get the shopping for me, or whatever. Um, my, I happen to not be that wealthy on the account of I can't work that much. But my ex- some members of my extended family are quite wealthy, and when I couldn't, when it came, I came to the realization much slower than like everybody who knew me that I couldn't work for a while and that's the time when I was housebound for nine months to a year. Um, I was going to go and try and jump all the hoops and all the red tape and all that sort of stuff to get the disability support pension. And I had my GP's backing and I had a friend of mine who'd been through that process and was like, okay, it's really fucking hard. I could help Mm. talk you through it because I've been there a couple of years ago. She keeps it up and everything, but Mm. yep, I can certainly, because it's a fucking process. Mm. If you're not well enough to go through the process... You, you can't yeah, sort yeah. of thing yeah. like it's designed for people that are healthy not for yeah, people that exactly. have issues yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember discussing this with a certain family member because I was just talking about practicalities basically yeah. trying to work out practicalities and they're good at finance they have more money to finance deal yeah. with you know than me and the way they could help the way they felt good about it was just throwing me some money every few weeks yeah, yeah. more money than I needed just yeah. to live, to pay rent, to live, to exist. Yeah. And it was probably more money than I would have got on the disability support pension. Yeah. And I don't accept help or fine. I'm very frugal anyway. I don't accept financy stuff yeah. well. And I had issues accepting that help. Yeah, yeah. But the only reason I did and the reason I worked through my own personal issues accepting that help was because yeah. I know what a difference it made for that person. They mm. felt so much better and so... I don't have the words to really say it, but they felt like they could meaningfully help me Mm. in my life and meaningfully help the extended family as well. Not just me, but the whole family kind of unit, Mm. they could help out. And for them, that was really important. It's also their way of showing the fact that they love me. Yeah. You know, do I accept that money now? No. Do I say everybody that has a chronic illness should accept money from family members? It's up to you. It's your life. It's your family members. I could not possibly say... I'm not saying that not going that going on the disability support pension is bad. I was 100% up for it. And I, for months, kept going back and forth. And I had paperwork and I was ready to do it and go, I, thank you for your offer. You've helped me out for a couple of weeks. That's enough. Yeah. But I ended up having discussed it with my psych and other friends and family not to do that. Yeah. Because and I didn't want to take away the joy that I could give someone. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And by the way, just for, for listeners, when when we say that Dom doesn't accept help, what we mean is it takes like a four or five text message negotiation to get her to accept a fucking lift. Yeah, I'm not good at that. Like, this is... <laughs> and I still, it, you know, <laughs> jumped at the fucking chance when you're like, oh, maybe we shouldn't. And I was like, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. It's And that that isn't a shame thing. I'm going to point that out. Mm. That is a <sighs> stubborn-ass thing. That is a, I've always wanted to be independent. I always yeah, yeah, am yeah. independent. I came out of the womb not giving a damn what other people thought of me. That's just who I am. Yeah. And accepting help is kind of tied into that yeah, yeah, yeah. slight arrogance that I have in myself. I can I can handle my shit. I don't yeah. want to accept your help because no, I know no, no, I can I handle my shit. Yeah, no, no, yeah. not you. I'm saying yeah. that's just built who I am. That's not necessarily a shame thing. For it's sure. not a chronic illness thing. Mm. That's a, I've always been like that thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 The chronic illness is a really nice learning curve that asking for help is not a bad thing and it's something yeah. that I need to learn how to do better mm. always, even when I thought I've learned how to do it. No, no. No, I have not. Um, if I had to wrap it up in one really quickly, for me, it would it would come back to it's, it's not an easy lesson to learn. It's a hard and vicious one, but it simply is. The way to get through shame is to fight it on its own terms by speaking about it it is unfortunately um and i think also in a way if if you come to terms with it yourself and you can wallow in it and sit in it on your own and it's not confronting to you anymore Mm. then the shame factor goes away a lot because it 
doesn't it stops mattering so much what that initial reaction from the person you're talking to is mm. because you've already sat in it you've already confronted the uncomfortable bits within yourself and there's nothing more confronting than what you can say to yourself let's be real about that yeah yeah definitely definitely so that was, that was I our think that uplifting was us. episode on shame. Oh, we're such lovely humans. Look at us here. Totally. Go away, dance with you know, <laughs> flowers and unicorns. Absolutely. Tell us, uh, tell us how ashamed mm. you are of us. Of uh, us. On Twitter, on Instagram, uh, get us on email any way you like. Uh, leave reviews on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play Music. If you can do that, I'm not 100% sure you can. Leave Play comments Leave comments under YouTube videos. Uh, and if there's an element of shame Spotify. that we didn't discuss that you want us to discuss because yeah. it's important to you, just email us because we're sure. happy to talk about it. Almost anything. Yeah, when it's in text, as you heard from Dom, what will happen is she'll sit there thinking that you're a fucking idiot, but she won't actually type that at you. <sighs> Don't do that all of the time. Just some of the time, most of the time. Uh, it's my superiority. It's my, it's my arrogance, my superiority complex coming back. You know, I'm sorry. You're all just beneath me. Accept it. <laughs> Thank you, dear listener, for, well, for, for listening. A few words in these litigious times before I tell you how you can get in touch. Anything short of a coffee enema is not intended to be and should not be used as a substitute for advice from medical and psychological professionals. If you want to get in touch with us, and we would love to hear from you, you can email us at anythingshortpod at gmail.com. We gratefully accept suggestions for future challenges and books and other products to review. Or you can heap upon us criticism and abuse. If you wish to heap abuse but find yourself short on time, we recommend Twitter and Instagram, where we go by at shortofapod. If you like what you've heard, on the other hand, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. Tweet about us, or, like the common cold or herpes simplex, spread us by using your mouth. <laughs>